to the State Library of Queensland. And this is the smaller of our two auditoriums, but it's a really lovely one because it actually um, is one of those few spaces that feels nice and intimate and, and you can really hear the speaker well. So welcome. Um, firstly, let me uh, respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet tonight. And um, also to just contextualise this talk for you, if you like, um, we actually run in public programs here at the State Library a whole series uh, called Deepen the Conversation. As part of that, we in invite writers, artists, thinkers, uh, academics, all sorts of people to the stage to talk to us. The idea is that there's a conversation between the audience and on the stage and the person on the stage and also we hope a conversation beyond when you uh, leave here tonight so that actually you take home, it stimulates lots of ideas and you take home the discussion with you. So that's the purpose of it and please do keep an eye out for this whole series. We do probably one every couple of weeks and sometimes more. Um, tonight, though, we are extraordinarily pleased to welcome the critically acclaimed author, Susanna De Beers. Susanna's bio, uh, bio is huge, so I have edited this to be a very tiny introduction so you can hear from her and not from me. Uh, but Susanna De Beers is an international author and former lecturer at the Queensland University of Technology. She writes full-time but gives occasional study days as part of the Travel and Destinations Program run by the Continuing Education Department of the University of Queensland. So you can see we're privileged to have her here with us. Uh, Susanna's 14 books have won her literary awards in both Ireland and Britain. She's also been the recipient of the Order of Australia, and I think she wears that tonight, <laughs> actually, um, for services to literature. She's also had a Winston Churchill Fellowship. She has twice been shortlisted for the Queensland's premier non-fiction award. And um, not to be overlooked, she speaks fluent Spanish and French. Wouldn't you kill to do that? I would. <laughs> um, so it's with great pleasure that we welcome he her here, though, tonight to discuss this particular book, Desert Queen, Daisy Bates, The Real Story, an intriguing character, an intriguing story, and what a wonderful biography to hear all about tonight. So please welcome Susanna to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, we had a lot of fun putting this book together um, with deciding on the title. And there were two schools of thought that we were going to call it The Many Lives and Loves of Daisy Bates because, as you may know, Daisy Bates was a double bigamist. Uh, so Many Loves was quite correct in this. Um, she was a lot more than that, though. Um, some of you here perhaps learned about her in school. Hands up anybody who was taught about her in school. Right. Um, because... In the time in which I've been in, in Australia, which is 1975, when I arrived, she was still being taught in some schools and as a very saintly character, a mixture of sort of Mother Teresa and Florence Nightingale. Um, we didn't know anything about the bigamous marriages. Um, and then by about the 1980s, Aboriginal activists were hoeing into her and she'd become the Wicked Witch of the West, and she was withdrawn from the curriculum because she had removed part Aboriginal children. Well, now, you know, 28 years later, we're perhaps sadder and wiser, and we've realised why she was removing quite a lot of Aborig part Aboriginal children, and she really did genuinely think she was doing the right thing. The kind of sad part about it all is that she was actually an abused, neglected child herself. But I didn't find this out until quite a long time along the road of doing the research for this book. It actually took me six years um, to do this book. I went back to Ireland twice, partly on my own account. I was actually um, looking for my birth parents. I'm an adopted child out of Ireland. So it was quite an emotional journey. Perhaps my own story didn't turn out quite as happily as I might have done because not everybody wants to find adopted children out of Australia to come back again. Um, but I sort of channeled it all into Daisy Bates and I found out her story. 
And it was just so fascinating and so different than we had been taught. Because Daisy herself claimed that she was an Anglo-Irish aristocrat. She um, told everybody that her father was James Dwyer, a member of the Church of Ireland, um, a squire of Ashbury House, Ross Cray, one of the largest landowners in Tipperary. On the occasion she met royalty, she implied she was very much one of the aristocracy and she'd been been to hunt balls and she danced and she done all the things that they are that you know the Irish aristocracy do the Anglo-Irish aristocracy, um, and she got away with it. She hoaxed royalty on four occasions. <laughs> I mean, you have to admire her for her husband. Actually, she was the bootmaker's daughter. I discovered from Ross Cray. She grew up under miserable surroundings. They were dirt poor. Um, her father had abandoned her. She had a stepmother who loathed her, and her mother died of consumption. And her stepmother used to taunt her and say, you'll die the same way as, as your mother. I mean, I can't imagine anything worse for a child growing up. So she and her elder sister created an imaginary father. Um, this wonderful James Dwyer who lived in this beautiful Georgian mansion where they were surrounded by servants. And I can imagine these two poor, miserable little girls, because the whole family had been broken up. There were six children. They were all living with different relatives. The family life had just gone. So I took it up for her, really, and sort of forgave her an awful lot. But um, who has anyone here read Blue Ribbon's Bitter Bread? Right, well, she's not Joyce Locke, I'm afraid. I mean, I absolutely adore Joyce Locke. You couldn't say enough wonderful about Joyce Locke. She's very mixed, but she's more interesting. I don't find saints very interesting. Um, she's a fascinating, nuanced, complex woman. And, of course, I used to be married to the professor of psychiatry, who's now dead. And, but, you know, it's integral when you're interviewing patients. You look at the first five, six years of life to see what's, you know, what is there in the child, what can have happened to them. And the first six years of Daisy's life were really pretty miserable and they went on being miserable and she winds up on a shipload of Irish orphans coming out to Queensland, which is where actually I opened the um, book. It was kind of difficult to know where to begin and I thought this is really very emotive and I got kind of fascinated by these boatloads of Irish orphans who came here and I've bumped into quite a few people subsequently who said that their ancestors had come here as Irish orphans. Queensland had more Irish orphans than any other state in Australia which I find very interesting. Now if we could have the lights turn down a bit. Um... That would be great. And um, the idea was um, to put um, on the cover, you know, what symbolised Daisy, which was all dressed up in her best, going off to Government House. And um, the camel buggy in which she was the first woman who crossed the Nullarbor Desert, which I must say I thought was absolutely magnificent. Um, I thought it was a very salient point about her that hadn't been brought out in other books about her. her nobody ever doubts her courage. She was an incredibly brave woman. Um, she came from um, an area called Ross Cray, a little town called Ross Cray there in Tipperary. Um, I'll be taking you to Burr Castle, where she's taken by her grandmother, which is just north of Ross Cray. Ross Cray is really lovely. If you're going on a trip to Ireland, try and include Ross Cray. It's the second oldest town in Ireland, and it's a beautiful place. They've got a memorial to Daisy Bates there. Say you're from Australia, and they're all thrilled. Um, now, Daisy had covered up with this story about being the Anglo-Irish aristocrat from Ashbury House who'd gone to live with English aristocrats after her father. Her mother died when she was six. She'd gone to stay, uh, her father, then she says, dies. She goes to stay with English aristocrats, Sir Francis and Lady Outram, um, in uh, their home, Hallands Hall in Swanage. Absolute baloney. She never went there at all. Um, the Outram said they'd never heard of her. Um, 
But she got away with it. Communications took a long time to get through in Australia. Um, and so she, you know, she had such chutzpah, she carried it all off. But um, what rather gave the game away was that she'd been baptised in St Cronin's Catholic Church. She was entered in the register as the daughter of James Dwyer Bootmaker and his wife Bridget. Well, this didn't quite tie in with Ashbury House and the estate. When you go to Ross Gray, what you'll see is this archway of the old Catholic Church. But in the National Library in Dublin, there are the records of the birth records. So I was very excited to find the handwritten record of all this and then went back to Ross Cray and found out the house she'd been, found some, she was born Daisy Dwyer, found some Dwyers, all the rest of it, and the whole story sort of emerged. That is another thing that was left of this old St Cronin's Church, was the font. They now have a new Catholic church, um, but they've got the font where Daisy was baptised, is there? And that's the main street of Ross Cray, um, it had an old way bridge in the middle because it was a market town. It was a town where they grew a lot of flax um, and they had cattle markets. And that's the sort of thing that Daisy would look out on was the noisy market day with all the cattle outside. The thing, there were geese and, and chickens as well. And you can imagine cows and things. So at the end of the day, what you had was an awful lot of cow shit. So I'm afraid it was rather a smelly main street. Um, and her mother, who she'd said was the lady of um, Ashbury House and, um, you know, spent her time um, doing ladylike things. Her mother was a market woman and she probably toted around a basket like this and took her goods to, to the to the to the market she had a little garden plot and she was down as small farmer um in her in her marriage um license i managed to find all the marriage and death certificates and all the rest of it this was the house as it was in um daisy's day and it was the house there on the right hand side um you can see it's got a thatched roof it's now got um, a tiled roof and it was pretty basic underneath was the bootery where her father James Dwyer who unfortunately had an alcohol problem and spent more time in the pub probably than the bootery um, he had six children they married young he was a child of the famine so he'd lived through an awful lot perhaps that's why he drank I don't know um, but there they were the children were all in upstairs in those little rooms and down below there would have been there was the bootery this is the house as it is now it's got a tiled roof and they're turning it into a chemist's shop and they promise me faithfully they will put a plaque on the wall saying that daisy dwyer was was um spent her childhood here and where she claimed to be born, where she claimed to have grown up, was actually Ashbury House, which was just on the outskirts of, of Ross Cray and did have a lot of land and paddocks and um, it was a very nice house. But I think that she probably even never saw Ashbury House unless she worked there. She might have worked there from school. as a She might have worked there as a domestic or someone in the family might have worked there in the domestic. She wrote a poem about Ashbury House. She was sort of obsessed by Ashbury House. But, of course, it sounded very good. You know, I am Miss Dwyer of Ashbury House. Um, but the house that she would doubtless have seen was Damer House in the centre of Ross Cray, which is now the Heritage Centre. And she rather sounded, Damer House is grander even than Ashbury House. And it was, um, Ireland was a colonial, um, it was colonised, there was an army garrison, and the colonel of the garrison lived in, da in Damer House, and it actually belonged to the Earl of Port Arlington, who... Actually, there's an Earl of Port Arlington who lives in Australia now. I keep hoping I'll bump into him at one of these talks, but I haven't so far. Um, and um, so there, this was, she gave the, she must have, she and Catherine, her elder sister, who started the James Dwyer 
um, Esquire story, you can imagine them as little girls peering through the iron gates, watching all the quality going in and out of Damer House and saying to them, when I, and saying to each other, when I'm grown up, I'm going to marry someone very rich and we'll be like this and we'll have grand carriages and beautiful clothes. And they're ragged little barefoot girls who go to what's called the poor school. Um, their imaginary father was modelled on someone called Timothy Bridge, um, who actually lived at Ashbury House. And he was a JP, he was a lawyer and a gentleman farmer. And this is what Daisy implied that her father was. So he was a very respected man in um, Ross Cray. His um, memorial is in the in the Protestant church, because, of course, the Protestants were the winning side. The poor Catholics had lost everything. They'd lost their land. They were denied the right to education. Um, they were really the underclass. And so um, Daisy, who had Protestant um, relatives on her grandmother's side, um, and we'll see later, she goes to work as a maid in a Protestant house, and she's given a Bible, and I think she decides she's going to join the winning side. Um, it was, there's, you know, being Catholic was truly awful. When you went to England, there was huge prejudice in England and in Australia. I was quite horrified, the prejudice in Queensland. Pubs that said, no Irish allowed. And um, no, you know, no Irish need apply for jobs and things. So she kind of realised that if she'd admitted she was a Catholic orphan. She would never have got anywhere. And so these stories now um, became very important. They started off as fantasies, I think, between two little neglected little girls, badly fed, badly housed, um, and really neglected after their mother died. She died when Daisy was six years old and um, her elder sister, Kate, was eight and the eldest daughter, Marion, was 10, and there were three more children. So um, Daisy had a twin who died as well. I mean, this is an era of high infant mortality, of really very, very harsh, minimal conditions for the Irish. After Daisy's mother dies, her father, who really is called James O'Dwyer, that's about the only thing that's real in the whole story, um, is... Uh, gets in a girl to look after them, a farmer's daughter, and he actually marries her. And um, she, I'm afraid, does not like her stepchildren, and she urges him to go to America and leave the children. And she says that she's going to inherit land in America. And so off they go, and Daisy and her elder sister, Kate, and her little brother, Jim are with Granny, who supports them all by spinning cloth and selling it in the market. And Granny is a very kind lady who doctors the local uh, people, um, who Daisy um, calls actually the Bog Irish, um, rather snobbishly, um, because, you know, she is actually joining them at one stage. And she did all the chores, you know, they milked the cows and um, lived a pretty basic life. Um, and then Granny dies, so all the security this child has got goes. She's got no home, and eventually her father has died in a pauper's grave in America, and the wife comes back, the second wife comes back, the stepmother who dislikes Daisy, and she takes over the lease of Number 2 Main Street, the bootery. Now, it's no longer run as a bootery, but she's living there because... Nobody can own property. And this is all, I found this all in the records. And you can see she was not going to look very kindly on her two stepdaughters. So they had a pretty miserable time. She always remembered her grandmother's house with great happiness. Granny told them Irish folk tales. And this is why Daisy loves Aboriginal folk stories, myths and legends when she comes here. She sort of adapts from the myths and legends of Ireland into the Aboriginal ones and collects them. Now, Carrick Hill is, you can see it from Granny Hunt's cottage, and it becomes very important to Daisy when she gets a property. She gets a property eventually, a cattle property in the Pilbara. She calls it Carrick Hill. And somebody who will become a great patron of hers actually has a house in Adelaide called Carrick Hill. 
So it's a sort of theme through her life, Carrick Hill. The other thing is Burr Castle. I just showed you where Burr was. I don't know if anybody saw all the revelations in the, in the um, Saturday's papers about naughty Tony Snowden and his sex romps with Prince Margaret. Well, that's where he grew up, Burr Castle. His um, mother actually went off with someone else and she, was, she also neglected him. So you can see there's an awful lot of sort of neglected children turning into rather unusual people. Um, and so Daisy's grandmother took her to Burr Castle, but not to see the Earl of Ross, um, as Daisy implied. They, I'm sure they went to see the manager because by this time... I, when I went to Burr Castle and made inquiries and gave the date, they said, no, the Earl was very ill. He was called the Astronomer Earl, and he had the largest telescope at that time in the world, and he was ill in Dublin. And they said, oh, people used to come and they'd see the manager, and this, I'm sure, is what happened. So there we have the front elevation of the castle and this huge telescope, which is still there. You can go and see it today. It's called um, the Leviathan. And they used to put, as a joke, children inside the big iron tube. And they did this to Daisy um, when she was six. And they shut her in and you can... There's a sort of big drop thing, cover, that comes down with a terrible clang. And they shut her in, you can imagine, with all the spiders and crawlies and things, and they thought she'd cry out, but she didn't. She was such a little toughie, she wouldn't give them the satisfaction. She sat there for an hour, and then they let her out, and she said, oh, I rather enjoyed that. Um, and that's the sort of character she was. I mean, she would face amazing hardships and things without complaining at all when she lived in the desert and things. She just had an extraordinary character. Um, she's educated for free as, a, as an orphan and rather destitute child in what's called the poor school, which became the national Irish National School um, when the Irish got... Um, some sort of free education, but before that it was the poor school run by the nuns of the Sacred Heart, who were a French order celebrated for teaching. And they had this as a very expensive boarding school for girls. It's absolutely huge, that building. It towers over Ross Grey. And the wealthy girls used to go there and then they would hand down their clothes to the children from the poor school who would have chores to do. They would polish the banisters and peel the potatoes and do all those things for the wealthy girls. Now, if you've read Vanity Fair, you'll remember Becky Sharp goes to a school where she is poor and despised and is filling up the ink wells and being the pupil teacher. Well, this is what... Daisy and Kate and Marion did. Marion was the one who had the vacation. She was going to be the nun. Kathleen Kate was going to be a governess. And Daisy is always a bit rebellious. And they, you know, she was sort of marked, she was very clever. She was marked down for being a governess. But um, I think that she blotted her copybook at some stage. Daisy's elder sister, Marion, enters the church as sister Maria Flavia. Kathleen goes on to um, success with the story of James Dwyer, the owner of uh, Ashbury House. She goes as a governess to England. She meets an army officer from the Irish, the Irish Protestant ascendancy whose father is a lawyer who's quite wealthy, and she spins him this story and marries him. Um, Daisy is not so lucky. She's working for a widowed Mrs. Good who ran a nursing home in Wales, and she's a maid. She never, ever mentions this. All she ever mentions is that Mrs. Good gave her a Bible, and that Bible is now in the National Library, and it has an inscription to Daisy on the flyleaf. And one of the things that really got me into this story I thought it's just not tying up we've got I lived with Mrs Good in Wales I lived with the Utrams I lived with Granny you know there's some various different social backgrounds and milieus um it's not all coming together and that's what really made me investigate her thoroughly but Mrs Good had a huge import on her Clandidno I don't know if any of you know Clandidno on the coast cold and bracing in North Wales and um, Mrs Good was like her name she was a 
rather good lady who ran a nursing home when she was the widow of the dean. And I'm sure that she insisted on good manners. I'm sure she was the person who said, sit up straight, Daisy, and now round your vowels and do this. And when I, you serve the people in the, in the parlour, I want you to do this. And she really taught her to drop her Irish brogue to dress like a lady because Daisy's clever. She watches what everybody else does. And so she always, she really acquired the manners of the English gentry, which was why she was able to hoax royalty. This is Daisy just before she migrates to Queensland. You can see she's very good looking. Um, there's, I think this is going to be become part of a, a, a six part series for um, ABC television about great Australian women, sort of based on one of my other books. But Daisy has to be in it. I'm not quite certain if she's a great Australian woman or not, but she's so fascinating and so interesting that I think she's got to be in it. She was charismatic. She was beautiful. She batted those beautiful eyelashes and men just, you know, bent to her will. Um, and so she uses every weapon she's got because she's got no money. This is the Jane Austen era, you know, no diary. She's, nobody's going to marry her for her diary at all. Um, and she, in London... She gets away from Mrs. Good and she goes and works in London as a governess and she meets Ernest Bagelhole, whose father, <laughs> wonderful name, isn't it, Ernest Bagelhole? Um, I'd have chosen a more romantic one if I'd been writing a novel, actually, but I, I'm afraid I'm landed with what is the truth as a historian. Um, and his father owned a manures factory, which is even, <laughs> even less romantic. But um, his father also owned shipping, and his father was very nouveau riche, and he wanted, and he was Methodist. Now, the last thing he wants, he finds out that Daisy's spinning a line about being, you know, Ashbury House and the Protestant, Protestant family and everything, and he finds out the truth. And so the marriage to Ernest is off, and Ernest is made to marry um, his long-term girlfriend, Jessie Rose, who is a Methodist. Remember, I mean, this is an era when religion absolutely governs everything. And poor Daisy, Kate is married to her army officer, Captain Brownrigg. She is the failure. She really hasn't got a very good job. She's got no money her engagement has failed and I think this is what persuades her to join an emigration scheme going um, it's a charity scheme for Irish orphans and they take them to Townsville um, and they take to Townsville and then Brisbane but she's booked as far as Townsville but she always refused to admit the fact she claimed that she'd come in um, first class and of course, I came to the State Library. Actually, they've got the they've got all the records of the Almora here, and there, of course, it was all there. She was in steerage. They were down, kept down below. They were treated like animals. They were treated appallingly. You would absolutely weep when you read about it. I was outraged. So here she is coming to Townsville, and it's 1883. They arrive at Townsville on the Almora. And we don't know. Daisy covered up. She said that she went to Tasmania, where she went to the squatters' balls and danced with the squatters. And da 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 da. da. Well, I couldn't get any record of her being in Tasmania, even as a maid. Maybe she went there with a lover. I really don't know. But um, I, you know, you have to take Daisy with a grain of salt. But we do know eventually she goes to Charters Towers, and why not? She is Becky Sharp of the Antipodes. She's looking for a wealthy husband. Where else would you go but a boom town and in the gold rush? And um, unfortunately, the boyfriend she finds is Arnold Cahoon. And he is a journalist who loses his job. He's in debt. He's got an opium habit. Um, opium is legal at that time. The Chinese are selling opium. And Daisy drops him very hastily. Daisy does not approve of... Of drugs. She, she'll drink the odd glass of champagne, but she's really quite. You know, she doesn't approve of people who drink too much, and she certainly does not approve of opium. And she drops him like a hot potato. He's 
very much in debt after he's lost his job and he commits suicide in the hotel. There's an inquest and he leaves a suicide note which is handed to Daisy but the coroner never reads it out so we don't know what was in it. And Daisy now decides she's obviously there's a lot of gossip about her in town in uh, Charters Towers. She'd better get out of town. She applies for a job as a governess at Charters Towers at Fanning Downs Cattle Station. And she is well educated. They've given her a very good education, the Sacred Heart nuns. She, they are French order. She speaks French beautifully. She lards her conversation with French phrases. And they are correct, I promise you. So she's not putting it on. She really does. And that's seen as one of the attributes of a lady, dressing nicely, speaking nicely, speaking French. So they believe her there. And um, the, unfortunately, the person she meets there is Harry Moran, the breaker, who's actually, as well, he's got as many secrets as Daisy. He's Eddie Murrant. And Daisy persuades him that he should change his name to the far more aristocratic Harry Morant. And he does have a belief. His parents are way workhouse keepers. Now, if you've read your Dickens, that's fairly low on the social scale. But he's been educated on a scholarship at a private school. So he's got all the airs and graces of a gentleman. He's good-looking, he's charming. That's taken a few years later. He's a bit younger than that. He's younger than Daisy. He's actually five years younger than Daisy. Um, and he wants to marry a wealthy wife. Daisy claims that she's an heiress. Now, in psychiatric terms, this is called a folie à deux, when two people lead each other on with wonderful stories, which they do. They both talk about, you know, their wonderful parents and their great, their, you know, what they'll inherit and etc. etc. They both think they've got the bargain of the century in marriage. They get married in Charters Towers, the marriage Marant, Marant O'Dwyer, March 13, Charters Towers, in the northern minor. And Daisy, it's quite interesting, the concept of having a full white wedding dress doesn't seem to apply at that time. Daisy has this huge lace collar of limerick lace, and she brings it out for all three weddings, I reckon. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's quite funny. Now, look at her face. Now, call me cynical, but I just see that she's put on rather a lot of weight. Um, and I'm just wondering, was she pregnant or not? And did she lose the child? Because it is, I mean, there's the money angle. But did she get, did she get pregnant and then lose the child? I don't know. They got married, but it only lasted a couple of weeks <laughs> because Breaker Morant, as he will later style himself, um, is... Um, got no money at all. He thinks he's marrying a wealthy wife, so he pays for the ring with a dud check. And, of course, the police come round. Daisy does not. Daisy wants respectability. She wants to marry well. Catherine, Kate, Kate is now um, Mrs Brownrigg and part of the gentry. She does not want to be married to a jailbird. She really believes strongly in education and improving yourself and this, that and the other. And this is the last thing she wants. She's absolutely horrified, Breaker Morant takes off um, on a horse and the police go after him. They bring him back. He's up at the magistrate's court, but the magistrate has seen him win races and the magistrate is a racing man and he lets him off. But Daisy won't have any more to do them and I think they make a pact that they'll just never tell anyone they were married. They'll just pretend it hasn't happened. Divorce was very expensive at that time. You needed to put a bill through the Houses of Parliament. You know, a governess with no money and a horsebreaker who's paid five shillings a week are not going to raise the money for a divorce. It's lords and ladies who get divorces. So there isn't a chance. So I don't think we can blame her too much. And also, she probably thought, because he was younger than her, he was under 21, that maybe it isn't legal. It wasn't a legal wedding. So she says nothing. And we know Edwin Henry Morant. Here's his signet. He signs Edwin Henry Morant, Morant, and that's the drawing of him in the Northern Minor. That's his picture, and that's Harry Morant, the breaker, as he's in South Africa. And the signatures are very similar. And I found a, a hospital entry in a hospital at Mutterborough near Longreach. He was working. He left and went to work on a property in Longreach. And 
foolishly, liars usually give themselves away because they say a bit of the truth so they can say it with great, you know, aplomb. And he gave the same parents birth date as he'd given on Daisy's wedding certificate and he gave the same names. So, you know, he was really... And the signature was very similar. So anybody who says that Edwin Henry Murrant, who has no, um, you know, uh, kind of... um, a subsequent life in Australia becomes Harry Morant, the breaker. Daisy takes off her wedding ring, goes south, works as a governess at Pyrie near Berry in New South Wales on a rather tumble-down farm. And guess who comes home for Christmas? The farmer, the, well, it's a widow who runs it, Mrs Bates' handsome son, Jack Bates, typical Irishman. Absolutely typical Irishman, the blue eyes, the black hair, the Irish blarney. But he's left school at 14. Now, Daisy values education, and Breaker Moran was very educated. He wrote poetry. He was very well read. Jack has never opened a book since he left school, but he is drop-dead gorgeous. And he actually persuades Daisy, he's going off, droving, that they will marry before he leaves. And he, they've got no money either. So it's not, you know, it's not what she set out to do, to marry a cattle baron. But she thinks, maybe I can turn him into a cattle baron. He knows a lot about cattle. He's a drover. And so, and she's very hurt about Ernest is the man she loves. And she's been very hurt with the whole thing. She marries Jack, again, as Miss Daisy Dwyer of um, Ashbury House. Second wedding for Daisy. (laughs) Out comes the lace collar. And there, just by surprise, two weeks later, Jack's off droving, Ernest Bagelhole arrives in Sydney Harbour looking for Daisy. Honestly, if I'd been writing a novel, I wouldn't have dared give you this plot. You know, (laughs) talk about truth is stranger than fiction. But now all the marriage certificates are computerised. You can find out these things. So there at Newtown, we get the wedding of Ernest Bagelhole and Daisy Dwyer. And there we are again. (laughs) So, then all we know is that Ernie shoots through and he goes back to Jessie. And Daisy is pregnant. There's no careers for women, no university for women. She's a clever woman, but she can't do anything that's going to support a child. So she goes back to Jack. It's an They have a little son called Arnold. It's a very unhappy marriage. They're totally, totally dissimilar, but they don't see each other that much because Jack's away droving and she goes to work as a governess on other people's properties. And so what happens is um, after 10 years of marriage, Daisy's had enough. She leaves Arnold, who is not the son she's dreamed of. He hates books as well. She's the governess mother. He hates her lessons. He's very defiant. She goes to London and she decides life is changing slightly. Her horizons are broadening for women. And she think her dream is to become a journalist. Maybe Arnold Cahoon inspired this in her. But she goes to London... And she goes to London working as a stewardess because she's got no money and Jack has never saved any money for a house. She arrives in 1894. She goes back to Ireland first. There's nothing for her there. There's no money. Everybody, the relatives are all sort of struggling along. But, you know, they haven't got any money either. And she gets a job probably through Sister Kate, whose husband has died and is going to marry an even wealthier man which is even more galling, isn't it, you know? And she gets a job with a media tycoon called William Steed, who publishes something called The Review of Reviews, which is like the Reader's Digest. And Daisy is desperate to work for him. She goes along and she says, well, I have written some poems, and we don't publish poems. And she's so desperate. She says, well, look, I will... um, You've got a library and you've got an office. I'll dust your library... 
and I'll arrange the books and I'll clean your office and I'll learn about being a journalist. She's never afraid to get her hands dirty, Daisy, and she does. And she spends some rather wild weekends at Matfin Hall. This is 1890s. Remember, Edward VII, mistresses right, left and centre, house parties, bed hopping down the corridors, all of that. Daisy has these lovely weekends there. We're not quite sure who her lover was. She, she sort of covers it up rather a lot. She gives him one name, but I'm not certain it's the real name. Then she gets worried about her son. Jack writes to her saying he'll reform, he'll buy them a house, he's got enough money to set up a cattle property. Um, well, not really all that much money, but Daisy has got some money. Mysterious fortune. And I think she went and found Ernest Bagelhole's father and tells him he's got a grandson because the dates fit in much better with Ernest Bagelhole. His wife is dead now. He hasn't got a legal grandson. And I think she gets a lot of money off him because she comes back to, the, to Australia with enough money to buy 100 pedigree Hereford cattle and two large blocks of grazing land in the Pilbara. Now, admittedly, this is before Twiggy Forest got there. Um, and the Pilbara isn't highly sought after, but it's going to be an overlanding station from Broome down to um, Perth. And so she has a reunion with Jack. She attends a garden party. Jake, Jack hates all this sort of social stuff. He's very bad at it. Daisy's in her element. There she is, dressed up, beautiful dresses. She comes back with exquisite clothes. And when we launched the book in Adelaide, we had some of the beautiful clothes, actually, out on view. And they were quite lovely. I mean, she really had couture clothes, but she runs out of money and she goes on wearing the same clothes for the next 40 years. Um, she's presented to the Duke of York, the future George V, and he'll be the man who'll give her a CBE. And at the garden party, quite the thing, she talks to royalty, to George V and Queen Mary. Um, she has a painting aplomb. She gets interested in Aborigines. She goes up on a pearling ship from Broom to Beagle Bay Mission with um, a bishop, for, um, Bishop Gibney, who's trying to save the mission. And being Daisy, she gets off her clothes, gets into her overalls, digs a vegetable garden with the women, because, you know, she says, these women have got to eat vegetables. Their diet is terrible. No wonder their children aren't doing well. I mean, she's very sensible. She's saying a lot of things people are saying now. Um, and she gets them, and she gets them all very fond of her, and they call her Kabali, or grandmother, and she has an amazing empathy with them, and she loves hearing Aboriginal stories and chants. And... Um, so there is the church at Beagle Bay, the services. The, the church is still there with the Mother of Pearl on the altar, but there's a darker side to this Mother of Pearl. The Filipinos who work there, they have a marriage, and one of them will marry an Aboriginal girl, and then the entire ship's crew will use her as the wife, so it's legalised prostitution. And Daisy fights for this. Daisy is not afraid to pick up the cudgels when she feels something is morally right, and she gets the bishop to ban these marriages to the Filipinos because it's just... She sees these women living in terrible, terrible conditions. And, of course, they have all these children, and the fathers never want to acknowledge them. So that's Bishop Gibney and the Perlers. That's Daisy's friend, Nagilagi, who teaches her the Bibbleman language. She tours around a lot of Aboriginal camps, and then they take these cattle that, she'd bought, that she's bought, they take them down from Broom, they take them down, and this is Daisy wearing her beautiful riding habit and her kid gloves and all the rest of it. She's camping with the men. They go along this 80-mile beach, and Jack doesn't employ professional drovers, and the cattle break away and her precious Herefords that she's got with this money um, a lot, most of them are lost and she never forgives Jack they get down 4,000 miles in a side saddle they get down to um, Broom, to uh, the Pilbara and they have the most god awful row and she goes off and leaves him and she never sees him again and she claims she's a widow but in fact he's still alive and he has to give her their settlement is he gives her another two blocks of the grazing land and it's that money that she uses to feed Aborigines. So that's bye-bye Jack Bates. But you can see following behind, she's the tailor, she follows behind in the dirt 
of all these um, cattle. And it's a huge, long journey. I mean, she is so tough, Daisy. It's unbelievable. Breaker Morant dies in South Africa. Um, this professor plagiarizes her work on Aborigines. She goes on an expedition with him and learns a lot. She goes to a place called the Island of the Dead where Aboriginal women are dying of syphilis. And um, then she goes on to the edge of the Nullarbor Plain and she camps there beside an Aboriginal uh, camp and she studies them. She becomes an amateur anthropologist 20 years before Margaret Mead. And this is what's really important about it. Everybody says Margaret Mead is the first person to live with the people she studied. It's Daisy Bates. Her tent is small, 8 by 10 foot. I mean, that's really small. She's got a set of dickens, a trunk with her clothes, a table and a bed, and she lives there in freezing cold and blistering heat for 16 years. So I really think that we have to admire her. She spends all her money on Aborigines. Um, all her money goes. She's eventually bankrupt. She, but fortunately, she's found by a journalist called Ernestine Hill who writes a book with her called The Passing of the Aborigines, which, of course, was believed at the time that they were passing. And, of course, they didn't because now part Aboriginal people are now recognised as being Aboriginal, so numbers are growing rapidly. But Daisy's book, she left all the royalties of her book to Aborigines, she, um, and they were considerable because it was a bestseller. She bequeathed what was left... No, no, she had very little money, but she bequeathed the royalties. And what was the most important was that she gave them crayons to draw maps of their hunting territories. And this has actually got um, two Aboriginal big groups back their tribal territories. So it's really, you know, now... I think that she's, the wheel is coming full circle and people are feeling that she did put her money where her mouth was and she did do a lot of good for Aboriginal people. She said she loved them. She tried to get together a book about the Aboriginal folk tales. And in fact, a friend of mine, some of you may know, lives in Brisbane, Barbara Kerr Wilson, eventually published the Aboriginal children's stories. Um, Barbara, who was the first editor on this book, she said, my God, she said, if I'd known she had a life like this, I'd have wondered about doing a children's book about her. <laughs> so she's really very interesting and complex. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy her story. Um, Susanna has agreed to answer questions. And um, so... We're going to open it up to the floor now. We've got about probably 10 minutes left of questions. So um, we don't really need a microphone in this area if you've got a, a normal volume voice. So uh, what we can do is you can just stand up. However, we do have a, a roving mic. I'm just getting it away from the back. <laughs> we do have a roving mic and uh, it's coming down. So... If you want to use the microphone, the reason for this is that we're actually recording tonight's session. So uh, obviously it's wonderful information for us to put up on the website at the library here. It uh, links so beautifully with everything the library is about. So if you can grab the microphone, great, or otherwise a very nice loud voice so they can record from the back. So if you'd like to put your hands up, I'm going to vet the questions first. So has anyone got anything? Yes, over here. I have something written here about Daisy Bates. It'd be very interesting. Uh, how long is it? Is it? We... Um, well, about three years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. Not just, well, you know, we'd, we'd sort of like questions, but just give us a little snippet. Uh, okay. Daisy Bates, born in Odwaya Huntana, lives on the local Aboriginal. She lives in a place called the Police Pearls, which was an area bounding my father's western paddock. Oh, really? He told me that Daisy, about Daisy Bates being there, and there's an outbreak of lizards. That's right. Mrs. Peace from Katang used to go out in the sulky Friday afternoon, pick her up, take her back to Katang, to her home, give her a hot shower and a bath, whatever they had, feed her, and dress her, then on Monday morning, take her back to her Aboriginal. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, how lovely. Yeah, she um, really did. I mean, she was wonderful with it in that measles outbreak. I mean, I couldn't tell you the whole story, but it's that's a very interesting mm, insight. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we are going to ask you to use the microphones. We're getting away from the back that they can't hear properly, so thank you. It's just that I've just returned from Ireland and um, my ancestor sort of became anglicised. And I mentioned this to an Irishman and he said, oh, he took the soup. I don't know if you've heard of that phrase, but that's what ba um, Daisy did. The phrase is to take the soup meant that you changed sides ah, so right. that you could survive. And it's yes. apparently still a current oh, expression now. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's very interesting, yes. Here's another one. Do you think, as Ernestine Hill said, that Daisy needed to be a queen bee? She was authoritarian, dogmatic. Uh, she couldn't quite be queen boss of anybody else, so she chose Aborigines, to whom she was a great figure of authority, of course, do you think that's true? Yes, I do. I, I think that this is probably much truer of her when she's older. I mean, I don't think this is true of the young Daisy who was in quest of making a good marriage. But I think that her sort of rather troubled childhood and all that made her someone who found it difficulty working, difficult working with other people. And um, she fell out with quite a lot of people. Um, and I think that at the end... The rest of her family had done rather well. Brother Jim became quite a wealthy cattle dealer. Kate was married into the gentry and was very wealthy. Uh, another sister owned property in Ross Cray. She had really done nothing. For all this striving, they'd lost the cattle. They didn't have the cattle property. Um, she really had no husband. You know, she didn't have a husband who she was particularly proud of. And I think being somebody, being queen of the Aborigines, was some consolation. Um, we, the, the pity is we don't have any letters, and I searched Ireland, but I couldn't find any letters back to her family. But I think she probably, you know, put up a brave face to them about what she... The other thing that she desperately wanted, and it's so sad, she wanted academic recognition for her work. And this, because she was a woman, was always denied her. I mean, she did go across the Nullarbor in that camel buggy to go to a conference... Um, and give a paper, but rotten old Professor Radcliffe Brown had plagiarised some of her work, and I actually gave um, was at a lecture where somebody plagiarised a whole lot of my work, and I thought, ah, oh, what did Daisy do under these things? She went up after the thing and she thanked him very <coughs> and sweetly and smiled at him and thanked him for giving her work so nicely. <laughs> and I thought, what a marvellous, what a marvellous way of doing it. Susanna, what happened to Daisy's son? Oh, it's all very sad because I think maybe he learned that Ernest was his father, but he really turned against... He took, oddly enough, he took... Or maybe, maybe he thought he was Jack's father, but he was not at all the sort of son she wanted. She wanted him to be an engineer. He didn't want to have a profession. They quarrelled. She was away in the outback, living in her tent. He came to see her on one occasion, and it was one of the things in Aboriginal tents that a woman by herself couldn't have a man in her tent. She had this windbreak around it, etc., and she made him sleep outside because the Aboriginal didn't know she had a son. And he was furious about this, and he goes off in a rage. And I think there's been long-standing disputes between them and she had left him for a long time when she was in England and I think he never forgave her and he never came to her funeral he sent his grandson to her funeral but for a long time she never found him and there's actually a terrible bit at the end of the book on her 90th birthday she hopes that he's going to write to her and he doesn't she's living in a farmhouse at Streaky Bay as a paying guest with some people and she's hoping she's going to get some card and she doesn't and she actually goes and, well, she says she's fallen over the cliffs, but I think that she probably did attempt suicide. So it's really quite sad that she has all this, the CBE, the best-selling book, that she's famous in Australia after Ernestine Hill has, has done all these articles about her. But yet there's a terrible hollowness and loneliness about her at the end of her life.
going to say, did her grandson come back to Australia or did he stay in New Zealand? I honestly don't know. And I have been hoping, you know, often when you do a book, like the Joyce Locke book, I got lots of people writing to me with more of the story. But it hasn't happened with Daisy. I thought that descendants would get in touch with me because the book's been very widely sort of publicised around Australia. But no, um, a a great niece of Jack Bates got in touch with me, but she didn't know very much either. You know, she wanted to know what else I knew. Um, And no, I mean, I was really hoping this would happen, but it hasn't. I've got a website. Nothing's come on the website. And it is usually amazing how much you do learn about descendants when you have done a book. Thank you. Could you expand a bit more on her work with Aborigines and what the current situation is with um, Aboriginal people? Um, You said she's basically become a bit politically incorrect. Um, Can you just expand on on the work she did and how she's currently considered? What she did was that um, she actually uh, took out... She read in the newspapers that there... They were in the second year of a drought out in the Nullarbor where the Trans-Australian Express was going. And so therefore one, what had been absolutely impassable country could then get to on the train. But there was no drought relief for Aborigines. They were giving drought relief to pastoralists for their cattle, but the Aborigines were dying. They were dying in large numbers. And... So she goes out there, and because there's no refrigeration, she takes sacks of oats, porridge oats, um, so she can make porridge. Um, She takes flour to make damper and big tins of treacle and um, tea, black tea, which is what the Irish have always lived on, black tea. And um, she then gives the Aborigines what she's living on because it's no, you know there's a thing called the tea and sugar train that comes out um also for the railway workers and she also takes clothes but it's interesting because there are big complaints from the passengers on the trans um, australian train that they're naked aboriginals camping along the edge of it, and all the nice ladies are very shocked indeed and um they send out, the railway company send out clothes, second-hand clothes, which, of course, they've got no resistance to measles, mumps, or any of these things, and they get disease from these. And Daisy thinks it's so awful that she goes to a department store in Adelaide and fixes up, and this is when she's still got some money, um, to buy great bales of clothes, clothing in sales, brand new clothes. She insists that they won't have charity, they'll have brand new clothes. And here you have the charity child herself speaking. She's been the charity child in the convent. She's had everybody else's hand-me-down clothes and she's determined they're not going to have that. So she becomes really, her tent becomes an aid centre. Not only is she recording Aboriginal legends, chants, um, customs and going to uh, to ceremonies and things when she can but she's also giving out this and she um, also looks as a picture in the book where she's actually um, with one of these women you know because they get yours they get syphilis they get terrible sores all over them and she when she was at Beagle Bay one of the monks there gave her a special recipe for a salve that she used to rub on their sores she always used to wear she was very aware of the problems of syphilis being catching. So she always had white cotton gloves and an overall. And she would look after... And a lot of the younger Aborigines people went away to try and get jobs on cattle properties. And this left old people with no relatives. Now, as the culture was, you cared for your own relatives, but you didn't care for other people's I mean, this is subsistence living. And so... Um, she looks after them and she says in return for information she will look after these elderly people and she does and she talks about holding their hands as they die and um, they go they talk about death as Nalba and she's with them at the moment of death and then she helps bury them so she's really very closely involved and she talks about them as her friends and um, I really can't tell you because I went on a trip to the outback for great Australian women 
I went to Alice Springs to write about um, the first woman in Alice Springs in the telegraph station, and I went up to Catherine. But every time I tried to interview Aboriginal people, they'd all gone on sorry business. So um, I really can't tell you what they think about Daisy Bates. It was quite infuriating, actually. And then I went out Hermansburg Mission, and um, they'd all gone on, on sorry business there. So um, the man in the tea room was tearing his hair out because he had no one who they were all, people had all come to see the Namajiras. But um, there was just nobody. So I'm really, you'd have to ask an anthropologist. Sorry, we'll just wait. <laughs> we'll, we'll just make this the last question. Okay, thanks. I understood it was the half caste uh, Aborigines that she was sort of more against because of. Yeah, she I think thought that's a word we don't use now. Um, but it was, I mean, oh, yes. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's not politically correct at all. Um, it's actually, it was. I mean, she felt very strongly. At the time, these children were the last to be fed. I mean, there's a very, if you're living in a tribal situation, the men were the hunters of the important ones. They've got to have the food for people to survive. Then the women are the gatherers. They get the next lot of food, the Aboriginal women, and then the Aboriginal children, and then the last people, who if there was anything left, they, they might get a bit of the entrails or something, would be the part Aboriginal children. And so they were very undernourished, a lot of them. Um, and I think that this was one of the reasons she had them removed. But she did change towards the end, because she began to realise that the missions weren't giving them the education that she'd hoped they'd get. And then she started hiding Aboriginal children in her tent when the police came around. So she had a complete switch. But it was, at the beginning, the original um, you know, police remit was the part Aboriginal children. They really, and I think this has got rather confused in the story of the Stolen Generation, that really it's not brought out, it's now beginning to come out. Twiggy Forrest has just made a speech about it and said, look, a lot of these children, they were actually saved. They were very lucky. Um, of course, some of them had dreadful lives, and I feel deeply, deeply sorry for them. And, you know, you, you know, some of those stories would make you cry. But it was the intent to try and feed them up. And I talked to one man at the Alice Springs Telegraph Station, and he had been taken away. And he said, I'm terribly glad I was because I was very ill. I would have died in the Aboriginal camp. And he was taken. The Telegraph Station then became... Um, a, a holding station for part Aboriginal children. So it's a very confused, it's a much more confused story, really, than has, than has come out. And um, I've tried to present both sides, put references from both sides in, in the book. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Susanna. We're going to have to leave that there tonight. I'm sure there's many more questions. Um, what a wonderful talk to have in a library in Queensland. It's such a great Queensland story, isn't it? It's extraordinary. And um, I think that we've all heard little snippets about her life, but to put it all together in one context and take us through that, that show was just beautiful. Thank you so much. Before we thank Susanna formally, um, just to let you know that Susanna has agreed to sign books outside and um, so please, as we always say, it, a, a book that's signed is worth five that aren't. <laughs> so it's always lovely to have them on the shelf. And um, if on your way out too, please do collect our What's On. It'll give you all of the talks that are coming up. We also have feedback forms outside and we'd really appreciate that. And you can actually sign up to be on our uh, mailing list if you'd like to for the What's On and then you will certainly be in touch with what's happening here at the State Library. But if you could join me uh, in sincerely thanking Susanna for her beautiful presentation. Thank you.